Hey, here we are with Christopher Marlowe and Dr. Faustus. So there's lots of sins, right? Maybe sometimes the sin is just wanting to know a little bit too much. Seems awkward, especially in a college environment, to think that knowledge is a sin. But the problem could be what type of knowledge. Too much knowledge might be bad. Got us cast out of Eden, right? I mean, what was it that Eve did in the Garden of Eden story? She ate from the fruit of the tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, that was the tree, knowledge of good and evil. You know, the character of Dr. Faustus has a long history far before uh, Christopher Marlowe writes this play for us. Um, and in fact, if you want, right, you can go to the Bible and read a passage in Acts. That's the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verses 9 through 12, uh, 24, pardon me, 9 through 24. Um, it's a story of a character named Simon Magus. Magus, magician, mm, not too far away, right? The Magi, magicians. Um, there's kind of a long history of a conflict between miracle and magic. That is, miracle is from God, magic is from Satan, Lucifer, the devil. Right? And in this play, the main character, Dr. Faustus, has essentially achieved all kinds of knowledge, right? He lives, that's what he thinks, right? At the beginning of the play, right in scene one, right, he's, he's raging about the limits, the limits that he feels. Because he is, you know, he's like PhD, Dr. Emeritus, Superman, but he's hit the limits in every field of study. Right? For instance, and this is probably most important, when he talks about medicine, right? When he talks about medicine, he finds that he, while he comes up with great, wonderful cures for diseases, his pronouncements are heralded all over the place, right? He cannot defeat death. That's the ultimate, right? And because he cannot defeat death, he's unhappy. As it says, Couldst thou make men to live eternally, or being dead, raise them to life again? Right? It reminds me, and you pardon if I kind of veer off for a second, it reminds me a little bit of Frankenstein, the story of Dr. Frankenstein, who's trying to create life out of death. Right? He zaps the dead corpse that he has you know, sewn together and brings it to life. Right? We're talking about going to a, a direction, going to a step that you're not supposed to go. Right? Playing God. And that's what he wants to do. That's what Dr. Faustus wants to do. Right? He's, he's not Dr. Frankenstein, but he is... Uh, still that same uh, sin, if you will, right? The sin of wanting to play God. He wants to defeat death. Now, from the point of view of, of the Christian audience, right, immediately they would recognize the fallacy here and say, no, you can only defeat death through God, right? Through your religious faith, right? And that's a kind of a central dynamic, obviously, in the entire poem. A play, pardon me, in the entire play. Because, of course, as we know, you know, Faustus decides to sell his soul to get all this forbidden knowledge. Right? To get the forbidden knowledge, to know things. Right? And he hates all these limits that he has. And so he sees Lucifer, if you will, as granting uh, limitless power for only a period of time right 24 years right 
Uh, what's interesting to me, of course, also is the, the, the whole dynamic. Now, you may or may not know, as I said, this play, Faustus, has predecessors, and it also has successors as well, other writers who wrote about this very key story. And, you know, I'm not giving anything away, I hope, you, you, when, you, when you watch this video and you're going to read the play, if you haven't read it already, um, this telling of the tale, uh, Faustus does not have a happy ending, right? Uh, you know, God basically, uh, you know, ha takes him to hell. No, I'm sorry, God doesn't take him to hell. Lucifer takes him to hell. Um, and that's a key scene, right, at the end of the story. Why doesn't he get saved? Uh, and that's an important question, which maybe you'll work into the discussion thread. A couple other things I wanted to mention about this play. First of all, this begun th this the whole thing about plays in Elizabethan England. Uh, maybe I'm working from too many assumptions. Uh, hopefully, everybody understands and knows. That, for instance, there were no women who were allowed to act on the stage in England during this time. This is you know the same time as Shakespeare, right? Um, women parts were played by boys. There are no theaters, legitimate theaters, that are allowed to operate inside the city of London. They were outside the city. But it really, that wasn't that big of a deal. Because all you had to do was like cross the river or go outside the city walls. That wasn't a huge problem. Uh, but they did have to be essentially, quote, unquote, licensed, right? Um, the theater companies had to be um, sponsored, if you will. They had a patron uh, of some sort of noble stature. You couldn't just have freelancers running around the countryside because in a um, in an attitude towards actors that you might find somewhat curious, they thought they were very immoral people. I mean, I think Hollywood has put that to rest, right? Come on. But, you know, you had traveling bands of actors going from place to place to place, and who knows what's going to happen while they're there, and then they're just going to turn around and leave and everybody else is left with the consequences, right? So people didn't like that so much. So they had to be, you know, they had to be sponsored. They, they, they were, um, how should I put this? They're, they're basically, you know, outsiders, kind of shady outsiders. The plays, uh, Faustus is an example of what is called a morality play. Morality play is concerned with the fate of the soul, okay, which is a very important question. Other plays at the time include mystery plays, which are dramatization of Bible stories, passion plays, which are dramatizations of the Easter week story, beginning with, of course, Palm Sunday, and ending with Easter Sunday, um, and miracle plays, which dealt with the lives of the saints. So if I were thinking about those four types of plays, what's the commonality? Well, they all have religious stories. They're all religiously themed stories, okay? Um, again, uh, that's not surprising. Consider the time. Um, now, as I said, this play is, is a um, morality play. It is about good and evil, right and wrong. And one of the things that happens in this play is we see that what Faustus does doesn't just affect Faustus. The structure of the play has what we call echoes. There is a scene, and then the scene that follows is what we can call an echo scene. Now, on the one hand, uh, the echo scene is a bit of comedy. And... You know, maybe, again, you know this, maybe you've heard this talking about Shakespeare or other things that, you know, you have these kind of highfalutin ideas and you have this kind of low, crass uh, comedy because you wanted to please everybody. You had the, you had the uh, expen expensive seats, right, the rich people going to see the plays, but you also had the ground links. The people would pay, you know, the, the lowest possible amount and literally not have a a chair or a seat, but they would sit on the ground in front of the stage, right? Um, the groundlings. And so, you know, 
there is some argument that you know you have these dynamics you can see it in shakespeare as well kind of kind of a crude sort of humor but the echo scenes in faustus are a little bit more than just that one of the things that happens in the echo scenes is basically they reinforce the lesson of the earlier scene or in other words we see that the consequences of the great trickle down to the low in other words if you are a high up person like a dr faustus right your actions matter not just simply to you but because they have a social impact people look at you they follow you you're a role model for them and so if you behave badly then they're going to behave badly and that's what really is happening in the echo scenes so essentially every even number scene is an echo scene right the first scene is high second scene is low eventually this breaks down and we see faustus himself entering the echo scenes as well which i take as kind of a subtle but clear show of his decline right that faustus dr faustus himself slowly but steadily declines in his own importance his own seriousness and he instead winds up no better than the lowest class characters who were you know causing us to laugh earlier in the play and there, there's a definite uh, theme there right there's a definite thing that you can see as the structure of the play is you know forcing us to see this downward movement of somebody who begins to play very high up he's got like three phds you know he, he's super 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 educated very well thought of and by the end no not so much he's ready to go to hell literally go to hell now a couple of other notes right as you read through this uh, one of the things that I often pay attention to is Mephistopheles. Uh, Mephistopheles is basically the demon who is an assistant to Lucifer. And he is the one who is paired off with Faustus for most of the play. Right? And what's funny, haha, -ha, funny or just curious funny, is that Mephistopheles can tell Faustus really the truth. In other words, Faustus just doesn't believe anything's going to happen. He doesn't believe all these wives' tales about hell are true, even though he's sitting there talking to a demon from hell. And the demon's like, come on, here I am, right? What's not to believe? Right? But he doesn't. One of, the, one of the keys that I want you to think about is why doesn't Faustus believe? Even after he meets Lucifer, even after he signs the contract in his own blood, why does he insist that no, nothing's going to happen? He rejects repeated attempts to turn him to salvation. He also rejects the idea that anything bad is going to happen to him repeatedly, even though he is given this Mephistopheles as a companion for 24 years to get whatever he wants, to do whatever he wants with certain limits, right? Um, I think it's very important to think about that because I think that story is meant not just to describe a single person. You know, I want to get up on my minister's pulpit here. Right? It's not just about Dr. Faustus. If it were, it probably wouldn't have any resonance, right? Wouldn't have any real meaning to us. How is Marlowe connecting it to the everyday person, the groundling, and the noble in the expensive seats? Right? as we kind of go through our lives behaving, shall we say, in certain ways.
Enjoy.